All right, I'll keep this pretty short so we can all hear who we actually came here to hear, uh, Terry. But while I was researching this whole topic of community-supported agriculture, I came across Terry, and I found her to be a really compelling story just because she is a Los Angeles-based entrepreneur. She's local, and she wants to support um, organic farmers on the small scale, and I think that's something that's really unique and also it ties in really well with her restaurant, with her normal business model. And that's kind of why we selected Terry. Um, some quick highlights about her. In the 90s, she was part of a female punk band, and that was before <laughs> starting her restaurant, which is now Zygon rated. And at her restaurant, what she tries to do is really highlight seasonal fruits, vegetables, meats, and poultry. And that's really become the calling card of Auntie Anne's. She also competed against Bobby Flay in a throwdown uh, for her red velvet cupcakes. If you had a chance to try them in the back, they're amazing. And in 2008, she launched her organic produce and uh, produce and dinner delivery service. And that's what she's here to talk about today. So hopefully you guys are enjoying the food and you guys can all learn something. Terry Wall. Uh, thank you so much for coming. It means a lot. It's great. Um, I think I'm going to just start with my background and sort of how I got started um, and then launch into why I did it and why I'm doing it and how I'm doing it. Um, I started my catering company 12 years ago out of my house and um, I just knew my whole life I wanted to cook, whether it was going to be a restaurant or a catering business or, you know, home cook, um, cooking for other people at their house. I just knew it was going to be something with food. And I didn't start out thinking, like, how can I make a lot of money? How, what can I do with my life to make a bunch of money? I just knew I wanted to be cook and that, to cook, and that's how I was going to be the happiest. Um, doing something I liked. Um, so I had a friend who was in the film business and they were doing, I think it was a Counting Crows video. And he said, oh, I know you wanna you know, start catering. or Do you wanna cater for us for the next three days for 60 people a day? I was like, um, yeah, sure. It's like, um, oh God, how am I gonna do that? So I called my mom, I was like, mom, oh my God, I have to cook for 60 people three days in a row, come to my house and help me. I don't, you know, I didn't have any equipment or anything. Well, I pulled it off and at that point, it was just all word of mouth. Um, they were like, oh, there's this caterer and you know, blah, blah, blah. I never advertised, never did anything like that. It was just, I was gonna cook good food uh, you know, drop off food, which um, on like television sets and music videos and stuff like that, it's really hard to come by. And I was just gonna do good food for people, no matter what. And I did, I did it for years and years. And it finally came to the point where the catering was too big to do out of my house. And you know, my boyfriend at the time was like, you've got to get this out of here, because it was just food all the time, day in and day out. And so that's when I opened my restaurant, um, and that was eight years ago. And I sat, you know, it was gonna be something that was open to the public. I, I basically needed it as a space to run my catering out of, but if I was going to have something that was open to the public, it was gonna be good. So I, you know, really concentrated on the restaurant for a long time and sort of had this thing in my head that I wanted the restaurant to be. I wanted it to be um, like really sort of homemade food, like meatloaf and mashed potatoes and, you know, cupcakes and layer cakes and cinnamon buns and things like that, but made with really good ingredients. So it's the stuff you ate when you were a kid know if your mom was a good cook um, <laughs> but it was done with really good ingredients so it was even better and I had this vision of I, and that's what we're known for now is our cupcakes which I never that was never a goal of mine 
but you know it's fine absolutely absolutely <laughs> fine I embrace it at this point but um I always have this vision of these like cutie waitresses walking through the restaurant with these giant cupcakes um, that you know were meant for two people and you know that our, our cupcakes that we sell at the restaurant are gigantic and but people order them you know just for themselves at this point it's just like so but anyway we got really we got really known for our cupcakes and at first I was sort of pissed off it's like no, I make way better food than cupcakes. You know, just I. But then, you know, I started, you know, to realize like, well, if they're coming in for the cupcakes, they're gonna eat, you know, breakfast and lunch too. So, in any case, um, you know, it sort of got off the ground that way, and um, you know, it, it became really popular. And the one thing that I never ever wavered from from day one was that we were going to use seasonal produce, we were going to buy from local farmers, and we were going to shop the farmers markets for everything, and never go the cheap route. And you know, you can get you can get the same thing, you know, from a cheap delivery service. Who knows where it's grown? You have no idea where it's shipped in from. Um, but it it doesn't taste as good because it's you know it's not picked when it's fresh and in season, so on and so forth. And I never ever wavered from that. And there are points, you know, at the beginning when we were slower. Um, and when people didn't really know about us, and I was like, oh my God, you know, it's, it's, it, it, it's hard to make a profit. Well, you can make a better profit if you get a cheaper product. Never, it was not going to be worth it for me to do that. It was not going to be worth it for my heart and my soul to serve crappy food and cheap food. So I just, you know, sort of stuck with it and didn't make as big as a profit at first as you know you probably should as a, as a business starting out but it stuck and we became popular and you know we've got lines out the door all the time now and I still even stand back now like oh my god what how, how did I make this <laughs> how did this happen this is you know it's crazy um, and I still never ever take it for granted ever um, and we still cater a ton, uh, you know, just as much, if not more, than we did before. Um, and the restaurant's really busy. Well, we got to a point last year, um, and so many of my employees can tell you that, um, you know, they run, they run the business now. It is definitely, uh, they're all in charge. And... I did it like that from the beginning. I hired my friends. Uh, you know, everybody will tell you don't hire friends. I only hired my friends because I know they have my back. And I paid them all really well, much uh, better than you're supposed to pay people, you know, sort of working in the restaurant industry. And I don't have any turnover of employees at all. And it's really hard to get a job at Annie M's because nobody ever, ever quits. And the kids there make great money. They make great money, they support themselves, um, you know, and then some. And I make a little less profit, but I still, at this point, you know, in my life, do really, really, really well. And, you know, it's taken, taken a while to get there, but, um, you know, it's it's a totally successful business at this point. Um, so last year, um, it got to the point where I sort of, uh, you know, worked myself out of a job. I didn't have to really work at the restaurant anymore because it was, you know, being run by all the employees. It's very sort of co-op run. Um, the catering a part of it runs itself. I have 30 employees. So I was just sort of sitting around like, um, okay, now what? Because I need to be busy all the time to be happy. <laughs> and I didn't have anything to do anymore. So I was like, all right, what can I do now um, to keep myself busy and have something else to do? And I came up with our organic uh, local produce delivery service because there's so many of my customers 
who say, oh, I would cook so much more, but I can't get to the farmer's market. I want to feed my kids like this. I want to feed my kids organic food. I want to keep my money local, you know, but they can't get to the farmer's markets because as most families, you know, both mom and dad work, you know, so on and so forth. So I thought, well, I'm going to start this delivery service of, you know, the, of, of our produce because I go to the farmer's market anyway. And, you know, it'd be cool to have like 15 customers around the neighborhood. I could just drop my little bags off on Mondays and, you know, it'd be just like a little project for me to do. Well, it's a year later and I think we have about 150 customers all together. We have two delivery guys now. Um, we were only going to deliver to the east side on Mondays, like just to my little neighborhood, but it got, you know, it got, we've got such a good response from it that now we deliver to the west side on Tuesdays. And, you know, we, we can, we can, again, we've never taken ads out, you know, it's just always been word of mouth, like, oh, this is really great, you should sign up for this service, it's, you know, so on and so <coughs> forth. So, I think it really sp speaks volumes to the fact that I have always pursued exactly what I wanted to do. You, you, you make your life. Nobody else is going to make your life. You are in charge of, of where you go, down, down what path you want to go down. You know, if you want to work, uh, you know, for a corporation and, you know, you make that decision. You make that decision to go down that road. And I always knew that that, I didn't want a boss. I didn't want somebody bossing me around, telling me what to do. I knew exactly what to do and how to do it, and I wanted to do it myself. <laughs> and, you know, I created my life, I created my life and my lifestyle for myself. And, um, you know, I never wavered. Money didn't matter when I started out. It was just that, you know, I wanted to cook. I wanted to make people happy. I was the sort of personality that needed that instant gratification of like, you know, making a roast chicken, have somebody eating it, saying, oh my God, that was so good. I was that type of personality and I knew I was. And so, you know, that's why I went down that path. But along with going, down the path of of, of uh, doing what I knew would make me happy. Along after that came, you know, the financial reward, and it's been super gratifying, and it's been great. I put myself through college. Um, I had to pay my own way way through college. Um, I opened up a little vintage clothing store back then and hired like an employee to run it while I went to school and sort of made money that way to get myself through college. Um, as they were saying, I was in an all-girl punk rock band for like seven years. So I saved all my money from that, from touring, from record sales and all that. I saved that to start my catering business and then sort of so on and so forth. I never borrowed money to do it. I just saved my own money and started small and you know, kind of bought new stuff when I got money, you know, when I got a profit back and I always reinvested in my business. And it's kind of funny when the whole stock market plunged. I didn't, I didn't have a lot of money in that. I always took my money, took my profit and reinvested back in myself because I trusted what I was doing and I knew that I knew I wasn't going to screw me, you know. I knew I knew where I was going and I knew I and I knew I was good at it. So I invested in myself. Um so anyway, but um back to back to the organic produce uh delivery service and why I started that was also a way to help support local farmers, which is what I believed so much in and believe so much in is, you know, is, is supporting these people who are truly, you know, growing produce, fruits and vegetables organically, 
you know, nutritiously and with their hearts instead of big corporations that, you know, just, you know, pump the stuff out. Uh, and, you know, there's no nutrients left in that food anymore. You know, the, and, and especially this food that we're giving our kids, there's, there's, there's nothing good left in it anymore because the crops aren't rotated, they're over planted. I and mean, that's sort of how um, the potato blithe happened. Um, they're, they over plant and over plant and over plant these fields and all the nutrition um, and nutrients are sucked out of the soil and there's nothing left anymore to fight the disease in these plants. There's nothing naturally uh, left that can fight it. So with these small organic farmers, they rotate their crops, they get it. They, it's, you know, old school farming, like, like we used to have before the Industrial Revolution. And I'm, I'm not I'm not like this sort of like hippie kind of, you know, back to the way it was barefoot, you know. I, I think that you can absolutely um, have modern day thinking and education and uh, technology also mixed with, you know, old school farming and just sort of back to roots and back to basics basics because you know we will have to in you know by you know 50 60 years from now we're going to be have to feeding so many more people and it's really really um a, a sort of conundrum it's like what do you do you know and you guys have the education and you know you guys are young and you know, you, you guys need to figure that out. You know, you need to go to Washington and change the food policy and, you know, make a difference. Make a difference with your education and, um, you know, and the smarts you have. And you know what works and what doesn't work because it happened in your, in, in, in your generation. You know, it, it, everything's sort of going downhill right now you know, socially and economically, it's kind of all the perfect storm that's, that's happening. Well, you guys can make change, um, you know, with, with, with your smarts. <laughs> Just need to, need to get out there and do it. And, um, you know, sort of be passionate about what you believe in. And it, I mean, you can tell just by having a class like this, um, you know, a gathering like this on, on campus and so many people showing up that people care, you know, they care about their future and where everything's going it's, and it's important. Um, so I think, wait, let me just look and see if there's anything else exciting I had to say. <laughs> um, and, but I think let's just take questions. Yes. So, um, first of all, you're awesome. <laughs> oh, thanks. Uh, <laughs> I paid him to say that. No. Um, so, how come you haven't been put out of business yet by competition? I mean, this idea seems so right for the time. Um, everyone, you know, is talking the talk of healthy food. Why don't you have a hundred competitors? Um, because I think that my customers are smart. I think people are smart. They know when. Um, they know good food. They know when it's made by people who really care about it. They know that, you know, all, all, everybody at my restaurant thinks the same way. You know, we all think the same way. We all are passionate about food and about where it comes from. And I hope that every single one of my employees goes off on their own someday to start their own thing. And I'm glad that they got their education and their roots from Mantiums. And I think that customers see that, and that's why we haven't been put out of business. You know, you can get, 
I think Walmart is starting to carry organics, which I, I kind of go both ways on that. I say yay in the fact that people are demanding it. You have to demand it and demand it, and then they'll give it to you. If people demanded that McDonald's was all organic and didn't, and they're not going to, you know, buy McDonald's until everything's organic, they would do it. They don't care either way about organic or not organic. They just want the money, you know. So whatever works for them. <coughs> I'm so sorry. I'm just getting over a cold. That's why I have frog voice. <laughs> um, so yeah. I hope I answered your question. Yes, yes. Um, hi, thanks for being here, this is great. Um, You're welcome. So my question is, how do you balance like running a business and doing what you're passionate about? Um, do you cook every day? How do you sort of manage all your people and still like do what you're passionate about? Um, the, I hope this isn't, this isn't too cheesy, but there's a saying that um, I read and it says, uh, give a man a job that he likes and he'll never work again. And I feel like I don't work. I feel I just do what I like to do every day. And it's not that it's not hard sometimes, because it is, it's hard and you're gonna cry and you know, but at least at the end of the day, you're doing what you like. You know, you're still, you know, doing what you're passionate about. And that's sort of how you that's sort of how you get by. And I cook at night when I go home. I don't cook in the restaurant anymore. You know, hard, I have 30 employees, and you know it's too big for me just to do it how I was doing doing it at the beginning, cooking for everybody who came in the restaurant, so on and so forth. But I have a whole baking staff. I have a whole catering crew. I have a whole restaurant crew. Um, I do cook at people's weddings, though, just because you don't want to screw that up. <laughs> you don't want to screw someone's wedding day up. That would suck. <laughs> so I guess that's how I balance it. Yes? Uh, one of the criticisms of the social entrepreneurship movement has been that, one, that it's an overemphasis on the individual uh, social entrepreneur, and two, that there's a, uh, a lack of a scale imperative, that people who have come up with models that work to serve social good um, haven't taken the next step of trying to expand it. There's been some sort of disconnect between the idea of if you have a model that works, it's your imperative to go and see if you can bring it to a larger scale. How do you kind of, you know, how did I do that? No, no. How did, do you see your responsibility as, okay, I've been able to make an organic restaurant work. Should I you know, give money to my employees to go create more in other places or those types of things? Um, well, um, I guess how I, I mean, I, I speak. Um, I speak at the grade schools in, in, in Eagle Rock um, uh, and, and just kind of you know, tell people like, look, this is, this is my business model and it totally worked and there's definitely room out there for 500 other people in my community to do it because the want is there for it. And, you know, I also think, you know, the more that the consumer demands it, the more the price will go down because there's more of it out there. And it's just a win-win for everybody. Yeah, I hope I answered your question. That's <laughs> okay. Yes. So you said you like within the business you've actually uh, kind of dealt over a lot of responsibility to the employees. But how involved are you still? Like, do you still come up with the seasonal recipes? Like, what? Like, what exactly you're delivering to the customer? Or do you? That's a good question. Um, she asked how I, um, sort of how I delegate and, and what responsibility I still have um, in the restaurant. Um, the, my employees that have worked for me have worked for me forever now. So we all have sort of the same aesthetic. And so I don't have to go in and say, oh, well, these are the specials today, blah, blah, blah. I can simply say to Donna, who runs the kitchen, 
uh, and by the way, it's mostly all females who run uh, Antiums. But um, I say to Donna, who runs the kitchen, except for Tommy, he's a boy. <laughs> um, you know, I say, well, this is what's in season. You know, right now, this is what I picked up from the farmer's market for you. Go for it. And, you know, she'll, you know, she'll do like a chipotle butternut squash soup and, you know, whatever. Just like a nice seasonal menu. As far as the... Um, as far as the boxes go, uh, what comes in the boxes that go to the customers, because it is so young, because that part of the business is so young, it's only a year old, I definitely oversee every single step of that. And I should mention that too. When I started the restaurant, when I started the catering, you know, I was working 15 hours a day. To, I mean, it was just, it just kicks your ass at first because you have to be there all the time and you have to make sure it's exactly what you want and it's done the exact way you want it and when the customers walk in it's like they see what you want them to see and you know but then it comes to a point where you feel comfortable sort of handing it over and I set my employees up for that you know the day they walked in the door it's like I'm not going to be over there I'm not going to be there lording over you I'm not going to be there telling you what to do, how to do it, how not to do it. It's either sink or swim. You're either on board and you get what we're doing, um, or you're not going to work here anymore. <coughs> Sorry. And so I set them up like that from the very beginning. So if something goes wrong in the restaurant, say a refrigerator goes down, they all know who to call. They can all call them they, you know, they get it fixed. If the water purifier breaks, they know where online we ordered that from and they'll call and they'll order a new one. It doesn't, the questions don't come to me. They're all set up to be able to sort of run it themselves. You know, one of the vans breaks down, they take it and get it fixed. You know, it's just, it's, they're kind of in charge of, you know, they're part of that business, and, you know, it's awesome. Everybody's friends. It's good. We just, you know, they're my family. Awesome. Yes? Um, we talk a lot about uh, social enterprise being something that's defined by having both a social mission and a financial mission. Can you talk a little bit about a time when your social mission and your financial mission perhaps you had to make a choice between the two or how you dealt with that? Yes, um, we, I'm gonna say probably a couple of years ago, um, made a choice to um, use uh, eggs, free range eggs from chickens that run around in the grass, you know, eating, you know, grass, and they're not in cages and, you know, uh, you know, just just sort of caged up and can't move around and blah, blah, blah. It costs more to use that, to use free-range eggs. But customers don't mind paying a little bit more if they know, you know, where that their eggs are coming from Soledad goat farms where chickens run around among the goats and those chickens are just there to lay eggs and they're happy and... You know, customers don't mind that because we are sort of at that point, I think, in society where everybody is, you know, everybody's on board, everybody's getting on board with that. And that's, so, you know, I made that social choice to do that even though it was gonna cost us more. And I couldn't raise the prices anymore because, you know, for, for a cafe, breakfast and lunch place, um, it's we're not cheap, but we're not cheap because we make everything by hand every single day, and our ingredients are more expensive. And but people don't mind paying that. I mean, just drive by the restaurant on a Saturday or Sunday. It's like an it's an hour wait to get in. It's crazy. I wouldn't mind that. Long. <laughs> uh, uh, anybody else? Come on, come on. Yes. How did you learn how to 
I taught myself. I would, I taught myself how to cook. I, uh, I remember being, you know, being the van on tour, you know, driving from city to city playing, you know, playing. Uh, shows and I'd be in the back seat, you know, with a gourmet magazine, like going through all the recipes, and we'd have cookbooks stacked up to here in the van, you know. It's kind of funny, like these tough girls, we're all reading cookbooks. <laughs> but yeah, I taught myself, I never went to school. Yes. Oh gosh, I can't hear. My favorite meal. Meal. Meal? Breakfast? You mean that? If you had one last meal, what would you eat? Oh, God. Oh, jeez. Oreo cookies and potato chips? <laughs> oh, I can, yeah, I can get junk food. Uh, I can get down and dirty. Just <laughs> uh, gosh, I, yeah, that's a hard question. I don't know. It depends on what weight I'm in, I guess. <laughs> yes? Um, so I know that you started your business with the, the first intent was to support, you know, the community, support the agriculture, and what sparked your interest in that, and why did you have such a strong responsibility to support the that type of thing? Um, the reason I felt such, um, so strongly about supporting local farmers for me the very first thing before anything else because I was a cook is because it tastes better if you're picking if you're picking a tomato that's in season you know we just went through tomato season right and during the summer and I'm sure you all had heirloom tomatoes somewhere you know this summer you can tell the difference in taste between a, a tomato that was just picked off the vine, right, and then you eat it that day or the next day, rather than these insipid, horrible, pink, weird things they sell at the grocery store. I won't buy a tomato any other time of the year but summer. It's not, it's a whole different beast. And so that's why I started and then you know, that's why I started shopping the farmer's markets, because that's where you get the best product that tastes the best. But then you start becoming friends with these farmers and hearing their plight and, you know, sort of socially becoming conscious about, you know, how much better the food is for you, how much better the food is for your kids. And, you know, uh, you know, sort of looking at, the rate of obesity, you know, in, in, in our country. And it's just, you know, it just all goes back to eating well, exercising a little. <laughs> um, yes? Hi, Sarah. Thanks for being here. Oh, you're welcome. Um, as an aspiring restaurateur, I know that moving from catering from your home kitchen into starting a restaurant is a huge step that has been a lot of moving parts. Yeah. Um, can you talk a little bit about how you made that transition? What kind of things you needed to put in place to make that happen? Um, I catered out of my kitchen at my house as long as I possibly could to make, as, I mean, because you don't have any overhead, you're not paying insurance, and it's totally illegal. Like, you're so not allowed to do that, as I'm sure you probably know. But it's impossible, you know, it w would have been impossible for me because I didn't have investors or anything like that. It was just my own money um, to just, you know, I'm gonna, st I'm gonna go out and start a business and get a building and do all that. So I catered out of my house as long as I could and saved up as much money as I could. And <coughs> it's much easier and cheaper to buy or lease a restaurant that already has a kitchen. So say it's an up and going, failing restaurant. That's what you want to look for because they have a kitchen already, they're licensed, you don't have to go through all of that. And if you can get it and be open within a month, you don't have to get new licenses or anything like that. I mean, you're gonna to have to register with the city and get a business license and all that, but as far as health department and all that, just total nightmare. Um, you know, if you can, if you can purchase a, a failing restaurant, you know, 
and if if it's going to be like a dinner dinner place, hopefully a restaurant with a liquor license or a beer or wine license, then then you're golden. It's 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 sort of the way to go. Um, you know, other than that, it's you have to have investors. You have to have it's so 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 expensive. So if you can cater out of your own house for a while, <laughs> go for it. Sometimes when times you know when you're just like down like oh my god I can't do this what happened to the days when I was catering out of my house it was so awesome it was me my dog my boyfriend and lots of money <laughs> uh. <laughs> yes I think one of the hardest obstacles sort of to overcome and I, I, I was getting sued um, by an ex-employee who um, he he was an illegal alien and um, you know that's it's just the reality that's what's that's those are the people who are there that are doing the dishes, that are, you know, cooking, so on and so forth. And it's just the reality, and, you know, it's getting a lot harder now. I mean, that, that's a whole other sort of social issue. I pay my guys, you know, just as much money as anybody else, if not more, you know, because they have really hard jobs. But, you know, there was a guy who, um, you know, who came in there, and it was his goal right from the beginning to, to sue me and you know in, in his mind and so he um, you know basically long story short um, after working for me for a long time because you know you pay him under the table I was paying him under the table he got some scumbag lawyer and was like she never paid me and there's no proof of it because there's no checks blah 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 all that stuff and you know, it cost me twenty thousand dollars to defend myself against this jerk, and you know he got every single penny that he ever worked for, and then some bonuses all the time. Um, and so, you know, what I've learned from that is, you know, you have got to keep good records on everything. You know, the very first thing you do is you get a bookkeeper. You know, don't do it yourself. You get a bookkeeper. You get a good um, a tax person and you know keep everything on the books even if you know even if uh, you know you're paying somebody in cash you keep records of it make them sign you know so so that 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 was a big bad hard one it's like you know you can't again it's like you can't run your business like a hippie you know what I mean you can't just like be a you know peace love whatever because because people take advantage yeah, that was a hard, bad one. Lots of tears. <laughs> uh, yes? Since you work with local and seasonal produce, um, have you encountered times where the price of produce has shot up dramatically because maybe it's a poor rain season? How do you, how do you deal with that as a, as a business? Um, yes, remember, I think two years ago when there, when there was a real, uh, there was a freeze and all the lemons, all the citrus froze. Um, and then, you know, these, these poor farmers, they that's it. That's what they grow. They grow citrus. They don't have, like, green beans and, and, and strawberries and whatever to, to, to fall back on. So if their crop freezes, that's it. They're, got, they're not at the farmer's market anymore for the rest of the season. And... <clears throat> You know, as a chef and restaurant owner, you don't have citrus on the menu then. You know, you don't have citrus on the menu for that season because it's not available. But my customers would absolutely, you know, like to hear that, oh, I'm so sorry, we don't have lemon bars, you know, for the rest of the year because, you know, the lemon's frozen. We're not going to ship, we're not, I'm not going to pay um, to get them shipped in from Mexico or, or Florida or whatever. And my customers are absolutely fine with that. You know, ex, ex, exclamation. <laughs> Anybody else? 
think we have time for one more question. One Come on, make it good. <laughs> so, um, yes. so organic is now a giant industry. Yep. And we're, I guess, in agreement that organic is better than the alternative. Yes. Even though organic is being brought in from everywhere in the world and shipped the same way. No, I'm not in agreement with that. So, I mean, I, I, so yes, you know, that, store, yes, that's it's happening. Organic, it's, I don't know yes. whether it's organic coming in from China yep. or whether it's organic. Um, and we want to support local, but local can't go to scale. Correct. Right? In other words, I'm never going to be able to go to Ralph's and buy nothing but local. Right. So how do we bridge that gap? Is it always going to be that local I can only buy at very expensive prices, either through you or the or the market? Or I think I, that's a really good question. I think it's like t triple fold. And um, y you as an individual can make the decision to, you know, take an hour out of your Saturday and go and shop the farmer's markets. Because you're going to talk to the farmer who grew that stuff. He's going to be standing right in front of you. You're going to shake his hand. And he's going to tell you where his farm is and, you know, where, how he grew it, so on and so forth. And yes, you're absolutely right. Local farmers can't go, you know, can't leap to uh, being able to provide all the grocery stores with local organic produce. But um, <clears throat> I think Whole Foods, they're super expensive, yes, there's drawbacks, blah, 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 but I think that they really do try to, because some of the farmers I buy from, they'll buy from them. And, you know, they'll try to um, support local farms and farmers. But it's a good question, and I don't think that there's an answer yet. And that's why it's up to you guys to figure it out. You know, it's like you're young. You've got good education. Figure it out. Think outside the box. I don't have the answer. I don't think anybody has the answer yet. But I think it's going to be a lot of different things. You know, just like with oil. It's going to be a lot of different things. It's not going to be one thing. <laughs> Okay, thanks so much for having me. It's awesome. Um, Terry, thank you so much for being here and for also presenting us with a model of a business person who really has stuck to her mission. You've stuck to your guns and you've also made a heck of a lot of money that way. So I think that's great for all of us to hear that. Um, please join me in thanking Terry one more time. I believe everything in here is recyclable. So thank you guys for being here. Before we wrap up today, please stick around one more minute, and we're going to hear from one of the vice presidents of Lacey, who's one of our co-sponsors today.